Hi everyone, welcome to my channel, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. How a plumbing clog led to the solving of a series of violent crimes. Many crimes, unfortunately, remain unsolved for various reasons. According to forensic experts, this often happens if not all theories are considered, or if one of the theories wasn't fully explored. Thus, grieving families sometimes never learn the secret of a loved one's disappearance or the cause of their demise. However, occasionally crimes are uncovered over time, often by complete chance. The investigation into the crime against teenage girl Rory Rush began with a call to a plumber due to a clogged sewer line, which led to the discovery of several brutal acts against schoolgirls. This case made quite a stir, and the apprehended criminal was found to be involved in a similar atrocity that happened 10 years ago. Although many believed that the police had caught a true serial predator who targeted young women, only two incidents were proven with great difficulty, despite the presence of ample evidence. Unidentified torso in a water body. On September 11, 2017, in the Canadian city of Oshawa, Ontario, a local fisherman spotted something horrifying in the city harbor. Floating in the water was a severely disfigured and decomposed human torso. The man immediately reported his find to the police, and the remains were soon retrieved and taken to the forensic medical service for identification and necessary examinations. Experts immediately faced difficulties in identifying the body. It lacked limbs and a head, and it was practically gutted. They managed to determine only that the remains belonged to a young woman aged between 18 and 25 years. It was impossible to identify the victim by fingerprints, dental records, or distinctive features. However, a fragment of a tattoo was visible on the neck, but it was impossible to make out what it represented due to the advanced state of decomposition. There was only hope for a DNA analysis, but no matches were found in the existing database and thus law enforcement began to check the cases of all young women who had gone missing in recent months. Only in November of the same year, nearly two months after the gruesome discovery, was it established that the body belonged to 18-year-old high school student Rory Hash, who had disappeared in mid-August of the same year, about a month before the remains were found. At the time of her disappearance, the girl was pregnant. Over several weeks, Divers thoroughly examined the harbor and the adjacent shoreline of Lake Ontario, but no other body parts, head or limbs, were found. It was also impossible to determine the time and cause of death. However, experts found that the body had numerous severe injuries inflicted while she was still alive. This led to the suspicion that the girl had been tortured over a long period before her life was tragically ended. The Strange Neighbor the story took an unexpected turn four months later, when at the end of December, David Wood's family moved into the house at 19 McMillan Drive, Oshawa. They immediately noticed a strange, unpleasant smell, but their downstairs neighbor, a single 45-year-old man named Adam Strong who lived in the other half of the house, assured them it was just a minor plumbing issue that he would fix in a few days. The neighbor tried to be friendly and communicated very politely, but there was something unsettling and off-putting about him. When David's wife brought him some homemade cookies as a welcome gesture, he didn't let her even step inside his apartment. Instead, he just stepped out into the hallway, closing his door behind him. She managed to notice that his living space was in terrible disorder, and the smell inside was simply foul. Adam took the cookies, thanked the new neighbor, and hurried off. Later, when the neighbors crossed paths in the yard, he apologized for not inviting her in, explaining that he was about to renovate and that his apartment was not looking its best at the moment. He again tried to be polite but was noticeably nervous. For several days, as the Wood family settled in, they tried to ignore the smell, but on December 29th, they finally called a plumber due to a sewer blockage and the intensified stench. The problem seemed minor and easily fixable, but what the workers discovered in the pipes shocked even experienced forensic experts. Body parts in the sewage, a head in the refrigerator. The plumber, named Sean Farndon, along with his partner, began to clear the blockage in the Wood family's apartment. Accustomed to unpleasant odors, 
They were surprised by how terrible it smelled inside. Soon they realized they needed to look one floor below and descended to Strong's apartment. Reluctantly, the man let the workers in, apologizing for the mess. The smell was even worse in this space, and when the plumbers reached the site of the blockage in the pipe, the stench became unbearable. Sean later confessed that in his many years of practice, he had never encountered anything so foul-smelling. But an even more nightmarish discovery awaited them when they decided to clear the pipe. At this time, the already nervous homeowner began to behave even more strangely. He did not step away and kept asking what the workers were going to do and how long it would take. He later justified his actions by saying he was simply curious as he had never seen this process before. The specialists tried to ignore Adam's actions and questions, but soon they extracted more than 10 kilograms of flesh tangled with long hair and bone fragments from the pipes. Sean was horrified when he saw disfigured and partially decomposed human fingers among it all. The apartment owner made a surprised face, saying he had never seen anything more disgusting in his life, and then asked the plumbers if they had any idea how all this could have ended up in the sewer pipe. Farndon didn't want to speculate and decided to immediately call the police to sort everything out. He reported the horrific discovery, noting that he most likely stumbled upon human remains provided the address, and waited for law enforcement to arrive, making sure that Adam did not touch anything or try to dispose of any evidence. The arriving officers immediately understood that Sean was right, and indeed human flesh had been extracted from the pipes. When they decided to talk to the homeowner, they expected to hear any sort of fabrication as an excuse, but the man instead bowed his head and confirmed that the remains of a woman's body had been stuck in the pipe, and if the police wanted other parts, they were in the freezer of his refrigerator. In the freezer, they found a severed head of a young woman packed in a plastic bag, along with limb fragments, obviously those that could not be flushed down the toilet. The house itself was a real dump, where it seemed no one had ever cleaned. The kitchen was piled with dirty dishes with rotting food remains, trash littered the floor, empty pizza boxes were scattered around, and among all this debris, there were numerous magazines of a specific adult sadomasochistic content. Also found in the apartment were intimate toys, gags, whips, handcuffs, and special devices for binding and hanging. Who is Adam Strong? Mr. Strong was immediately arrested and taken to the police station for questioning. The police were baffled, as this man had never been in trouble with the law before and was not on their radar. There was nothing on him. He had been living at 19 McMillan Drive in Oshawa for over 10 years, since early 2007, and none of his previous neighbors had ever complained about him. Adam Strong was born in 1972 in the small town of Cornwall, located in Stormont County, Ontario. There is very little information about his family in early years. He was single and had no children. He worked as a station operator at a local gas station and as a security guard on a film set. Those who knew him personally described him as a quirky and eccentric person who thought he was smarter than others. He loved to argue and prove his point until others agreed, but overall, he was not known to be confrontational. Upon reviewing the content of Adam's personal pages on social networks, law enforcement concluded that he was seriously interested in BDSM practices. He did not hide his inclinations and openly talked about it, posting related photos and videos. He never had a constant companion, but some of his former partners claimed that Strong was a true sadist and subjected them to intimate tortures, which ultimately led to their separation. Another peculiar hobby of his was writing reviews and feedback on adult films and magazines. Clearly, watching such materials was how Adam spent all his free time. Outwardly, he did not appear to be a criminal. He behaved calmly and composedly. House of Horrors at 19 McMillan Drive. Strong's residence was cordoned off and guarded as a crime scene. An initial superficial inspection suggested that a lot of work was ahead, and new findings could shock as much as the head found in the refrigerator, notably matching the evidence found. Law enforcement immediately speculated that the discovered head, limbs, and flesh from the pipes could belong to Rory Hash, 
whose torso was pulled from a water body four months earlier. This speculation was supported by a tattoo on the neck, and DNA analysis dispelled any last doubts. Blood-stained clothing and shoes of a young woman were found hidden in various rooms among piles of trash in Adam's house. Blood traces were also found on the bed in the bedroom, which turned out to belong to the missing schoolgirl. In addition, her blood splatters were on the walls, furniture, and even on the ceiling in the room. The kitchen was equipped with an actual dissection table, on which the suspect likely dismembered and gutted the girl. Blood traces, skin particles, hairs and bone fragments were everywhere, creating a horrifying sight that provoked nausea in those who inspected it. The bathroom was also in complete unsanitary conditions. Dirt, blood, and signs of brutal acts were everywhere. The toilet was dismantled and lying in a corner amidst trash. Clearly, Strong had tried to dispose of the body by flushing it down the sewer in parts. And when he realized there was a blockage, he attempted to fix it himself, but failed. Moreover, a large variety of sharp weapons was found in the house, which were likely used by Adam to dismember the girl's body. Some knives were still smeared with her blood. Semen traces of the apartment owner were also found on the body fragments retrieved from the refrigerator. Who was Rory Hash? Let's delve into who the victim was, how she ended up in the home of her perpetrator, and what happened to her. Rory Hash was born on July 9th, 1999, in Oshawa, and was the only child of a woman named Shannon Dion. Her father left before she was born and took no part in her life. Rory grew up in a rather unique family. Her maternal grandfather was once the founder and leader of a motorcycle club called Satan's Choice and was also known as a talented boxer with strong connections to the criminal underworld. Rory's uncle was a member of the Hells Angels Bike Club, led a daring lifestyle, and had his own legal troubles. Despite having such relatives, Rory's childhood could be described as peaceful and carefree. Her mother and grandmother did everything to provide for her, surrounding her with love and care. Rory was a good student, excelled in dance, and even won awards at competitions. People described her as a very intelligent, sensible, and open-hearted child. At the age of 13, Rory received an award as the best cadet of the year in her local army unit. However, at 15, she began to spiral. A friend introduced her to drugs, and she quickly became dependent. She began spending more time with dubious company, neglected her studies, and soon stopped attending school altogether. For about a year, her family tried to help her overcome her dependency by placing her in various clinics, but she relapsed each time and the cycle would start over. At 17, she ran away from home and began to provide intimate services for money to afford illicit substances. It was then that Shannon sought help from a specialized service for teens with dependencies, which managed to send Rory to mandatory treatment. The efforts were not in vain, and Rory eventually returned to a normal life. She found work as a salesperson in a local shop and studied remotely to pass her exams and obtain a high school diploma, with hopes of attending college in the future. Moreover, Rory began a serious relationship with a boy named Anthony, and in the spring of 2017, they decided to move in together. In June 2017, she informed her mother that she was pregnant and planned to keep the baby. Rory was nearly 18 and mature enough so her mother supported her decision. However, Shannon was unaware that her daughter had resumed using illicit substances. In mid-August, Rory met with local constable Christopher Crane at a shopping center. Crane had been monitoring her situation for the last 18 months, ensuring she wasn't falling back into bad company. That day, Rory confessed to him that she had relapsed into drug use and had lost her job a month earlier, agreeing to intimate exchanges for money or a fix. Crane was deeply concerned by her confession. He promised to help and asked her to wait a few minutes while he stepped away to urgently call a service to arrange Rory's hospitalization. However, when he returned, Rory had vanished and the constable was unable to find her. The next day, Rory's mother and uncle brought her to the hospital after finding her incoherent from substance use. For some reason, 
The relatives did not stay with her, but left her in the emergency room queue and stepped out for about an hour. Upon their return, they found that she had disappeared and she was never seen alive again. Surveillance footage showed that she simply got up, walked to the exit, and left the hospital. Her family filed a missing person report the following day, but despite extensive searches and the rapid spread of information on social media, no trace of her was found. Although it was never definitively established how she ended up in Strong's house, it is most likely that her desperate need for drugs led her there to provide intimate services to the man. Investigation begins. After Adam immediately informed the police about the location of the remaining body parts, investigators expected him to start confessing. However, once at the station, he became withdrawn and refused to answer questions. He remained calm and did not admit to any wrongdoing. Since there was no direct evidence linking him to the girl's death, he was only charged with desecration of a body. Despite his lawyer's efforts, the detainee was denied bail and remained in jail pending trial. The investigators didn't know how to approach him effectively and tried to provoke an emotional response to make him reveal himself during questioning. However, Strong was not easily manipulated and carefully avoided questions about how Hash ended up in his house and what he did to her. Meanwhile, he willingly talked about his love for bladed weapons and his extensive collection of knives. Searches continued in Adam's house, and in one room, hidden in a closet, a dirty hunting knife was found with dried skin fragments that appeared human. DNA testing revealed that the samples from the knife did not match Rory's, but belonged to another individual. Identifying the person took several months, but by July 2017, it was clear that the traces on the weapon were from a young woman named Candace Fitzpatrick, who had disappeared about 10 years earlier. Who was the first victim? Candace Fitzpatrick had much in common with Rory Hash. This teenager also struggled with substance dependence and legal issues, grew up in a troubled family, often ran away from home, and would disappear for months at a time, living with acquaintances and sustaining herself by exchanging her body for sustenance and illicit substances. She was born in 1989 and was 18 at the time of her disappearance. Her family did not immediately notice her disappearance and only reported her missing almost two years later, by which time it was too late to find any leads. Additionally, her lifestyle and social circle led many to assume she could have ended up anywhere. For 10 years, Candace's parents believed that she had run away, but hoped she would eventually return. However, the news from law enforcement in 2018 shattered their hopes of ever seeing their daughter alive again. It is notable that both victims of the suspect were the same age and bore a striking resemblance to each other. They looked almost like sisters. This led to the belief that the police had apprehended a serial predator. And while Fitzpatrick and Hash were not his only victims, only the remains of the latter were found. The audacious criminal. When questioned about the second woman, Strong unexpectedly decided to bargain. He acknowledged his serious predicament and expressed a willingness to cooperate, but only in exchange for more comfortable living conditions. He demanded a private cell, a large TV, internet access, and even specified a menu of his preferred meals. The law enforcement officials were outraged by his audacity, but conceded to gain the information. Adam started his story by recounting his difficult childhood, detailing how he had been abused by his stepfather from the age of five, and how he had started torturing and ending the lives of animals from the age of seven, finding physical pleasure in these acts. He also discussed his intimate preferences and lamented his inability to find a woman who shared his interests in this area. When the conversation turned to Rory, he described in detail and with apparent pleasure how he had dismembered her, expressing regret that his plumbing had failed him. However, the police were unable to secure a confession regarding her demise. Strong insisted that the woman had died from an overdose, and he had merely disposed of the body. When Strong was first asked about Candace, he was quite surprised, given that it had been 10 years. 
He tried to find out how the police had learned about her. Upon hearing about the pieces of flesh stuck to an old knife, he became somber and regretted not taking better precautions to ensure his own safety. He confirmed that he had met the woman, but claimed he had not ended her life. Nonetheless, the evidence found did not support his claims. Accidentally incriminated himself. In an attempt to evoke some semblance of sympathy or remorse, the police informed him that Rory was pregnant at the time of her death. However, Adam vehemently denied this. A detective noted that the pregnancy was in its early stages, so it might not have been visibly noticeable, but the criminal insisted he would have noticed. At this moment, the investigators realized that Strong would argue endlessly to prove his point, so they decided to provoke him into revealing more than he intended. They insisted that the victim was expecting, and he attempted to prove otherwise, claiming he had personally examined her and even held her reproductive organs in his hands, and there was nothing there. Caught up in his narrative and deeply recalling the process, he began to describe the details and his sensations, mentioning how the flesh was soft and warm, and at one point, he even spoke of feeling a pulsation. This led law enforcement to believe that the woman might have still been alive at that moment. Later, Adam tried to deny everything, but his statements had been recorded on camera and were presented in court. He did not disclose what he had done with Candace's body, and her remains were never found. Detectives also failed to learn about any other possible victims. During one of the last interrogations, Strong indifferently stated, I don't know if it matters, but I would like my condolences to be passed on to the girl's parents. Trial and Sentencing the defendant's lawyers insisted that their client was mentally ill, unable to be held responsible for his actions, and in need of medical care. The court faced the question of whether he was sane and could be held accountable, or if he truly belonged in a psychiatric facility rather than a prison. However, a psychiatric evaluation determined that, despite certain disorders, the man was aware of his actions and thus could be held legally accountable. The trial of Adam Strong began in September 2020, three years after the death of Rory and 12 years after Candace disappeared. He was charged with two counts of ending lives, as well as desecration of Rory's remains. Although he never admitted his guilt, the evidence found in his home and his confessions during interrogations left no doubt about his involvement in these heinous acts. Four of Adam's former partners also testified, describing his cruelty and propensity for violence. According to the prosecution, the defendant lured both women to his home, promising them money for intimate services. Given his specific preferences and the evidence found on Rory's body, he immobilized his victim, tormented her for a long period, and likely ended her life during the ordeal, fearing that she would report him to the police. On September 4th, a signal from his mobile phone was detected near the city harbor where he discarded the torso of the victim, hoping it would be carried away by the current. In April 2021, Adam Strong was found guilty of ending the lives of Candace Fitzpatrick and Rory Hash, as well as desecration of the latter's remains. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The verdict didn't particularly disturb the criminal, who noted in his closing remarks that his prison cell was much better and more comfortable than his previous living conditions. Six months after his sentencing, Adam unexpectedly confessed to the location of the first victim's remains. Following his directions, the search lasted several months until the police discovered human bones. DNA testing confirmed that the skeleton belonged to young Fitzpatrick, which was officially announced. In conclusion, investigators are almost certain there could be more victims in the Strong case, at least one more woman. Notably, when Adam was brought in for his initial interrogation, his personal items were confiscated, among which was a chain with three rings. He later asked for this item to be returned, noting that the rings meant a lot to him and he did not want to lose them. Subsequently, Relatives of Rory and Candace identified two of the rings as belonging to their daughters, but the third ring remains unidentified. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel.
There are many shocking stories ahead of you.